we'll go through a couple things and hopefully by the time we get to 76 Lambert Lane, um, you'll have that in front of you and, and I apologize. So let me just, let me kick the meeting off here, get it going and then we'll, we'll go through a few other things here. So I'd like to call to order the Town of Cohasset Conservation Commission meeting. Today is, uh, what is the day today? October 22nd, 2020, it's a little after 6.30. Uh, we are holding this meeting via Zoom platform. We have a quorum of one, two, three, four, five, six members. We will do this by roll call vote in a minute of who is in attendance. Uh, first off, our, our conservation agent, Jeffrey Summers, is in attendance, as well as our conservation uh, administrator, Angela Giso. I will uh, go do this by alphabetical order. When I state your name, just please state your name and say I, whether or not you are present here or not. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, I. Uh, Eric, uh, excuse me, Patricia uh, Corcoran. Uh, Tricia Corcoran Grady, just not to confuse anyone, I. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping back in the alphabetical order, Eric Eisenhower. I'm now third. Uh, Eric Eisenhower, I. Chris McFarland. Chris McFarland, aye. Jay Pimpare, aye. Mary Ann. Mary Ann Weatherall, aye. Present. Great. So we have a quorum of six voting members tonight. Also in attendance are our associates, Tom Bell. Tom, unmute yourself, please. Tom Bell, aye. Great. Uh, and Heather Siles. Uh, Heather Sites, aye. Great. Thank, Great. You Thank you all. Thank you all. So, yeah, yeah. I hear a little feedback here. Hopefully that's not me. All right. So I want to go over a couple of things here um, before we jump to the first item of business, and maybe this will clear a couple of things up. Um, so apologize. I did listen to the last meeting um, in depth. It did appear that there was some confusion. Um, I'm sharing my screen here to show you that Clearly, again tonight, I have no answer to this. This is beyond my pay grade. It's been brought up to the town officials about the Zoom link. And again, it is an, an IT issue. And it's really, it's beyond the control of the commission. So uh, I apologize to everybody for that. That is the Zoom link that you have in front of you. What we have done, um, and, and I wanted to show you that to try and help with the situation is I want to show you my computer screen here. If you go to the town's uh, web page, which is right here, this is the town of Cohasset web page. That's what comes up. If you scroll down to the bottom right and you see virtual meeting information, if you click on that link right there, and this will bring you to the board meetings for, for today and for this evening, okay? Uh, for the lack of time, I'm not gonna go through the Zoom webinar guide. I would encourage all the commissioners and the public to go through that right here in the best management practices. I will tell you that Google Chrome is the browser of choice. Internet Safari does not work that well. Firefox does not work that well. Google Chrome is the browser of choice, okay? So here we are this evening. It's October 22nd, here is our agenda, and we have two items of business that are in front of us tonight. For the public that wants to see some of the records uh, that are in front of us, they're easy, they're right there. We have an RDA for 35 Jerusalem Road, and then we have all the supporting information for 76 Lambert's Lane. There is much more than this, but uh, this is the most important and updated information that we have, and I wanna thank uh, Jeff, uh, for, for taking the initiative and working with Jen Oram on getting this up. So, you know, so any from here on in, moving forward, for the members of the public, if you want to see the applications, you want to see any, inform any information related to the projects, here it is in front of you. And again, you know, I'll click on that real quick. That's the RDA for 35 Jerusalem Road. It's 29 pages long. Knock yourself out if you want to read it. It's all there for the public. Okay. So having said that, our first item of business. So hopefully that clears it up again. We can only do so much as commissioners here. Have no control over the electronics. We're all volunteers. What we are trying to do is make sure that you have all the info. The public has all the information that the Conservation Commission has. And we're trying to do this in a timely manner moving forward. The minute we get the information, 
you know, you'll have the information up on that web page uh, within a couple days. So moving forward and, and, and moving this along here, our first item of business is an RDA for our 20-10 35 Jerusalem Road, jurisdictional uh, determination for Mr. Brophy. And, and, and again, in all of these public hearings that go out, this is the public hearing notice. It was went out on to October 6th. And from Angela, with all her information, it was through the Patriot Ledger. Uh, it was published on Wednesday, October 14th. That was eight days ago, etc. I'm going to read into the record the notice of public hearing in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 131, Section 40, the Cohasset Wetlands Bylaw and the Cohasset Stormwater Bylaw, the Cohasset Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Thursday, October 22, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. via remote uh, participation on a Zoom platform from applicant uh, Paul Brophy for RDA 20-10 for a jurisdictional determination on an isolated area associated with a residential lot bordering a retaining wall and roadway at 35 Jerusalem Road. The public is invited to offer public input on this application in writing by emailing jsummers at cohassetmass.org in advance of the public hearing and can also attend via the Zoom platform. Details for access to the Zoom platform will be on the Conservation Commission agenda when posted. The agenda will be available online at www.cohassetmass.org in the meetings hearing notices located on the bottom of the front page of the website. Information regarding the application will be available online prior to the meeting. Please contact Jeffrey Summers at jsummers at cohassetmass.org. So again, all of this information for the public, I'm only going to go through this yet one more time, it is all available. If you have any questions in advance, you want to submit anything in writing, please do so, and please do that to our conservation agent, Jeffrey Summers. Um, with that, Jeff, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute here, and I see, can we please promote, looks like we promoted John Zimmer uh, up to uh, a panelist. So uh, I will turn it over to the applicant now to give us an overview of the application. And I was, will say one more thing. The Q&A portion of this meeting, uh, please, if members of the audience, if you have any questions or comments, concerns, please put them in the Q&A. We will be mentioning, uh, we will be monitoring that. And, it, and it's very helpful if we have your, um, your full name in there as well. Uh, and, and if you have your address, that would be even better. But most of the people in here are obviously the uh, the panelists, so we don't necessarily need that. But the Q&A will be monitored. Don't wait till the uh, hearing is over before you put your questions in there. And again, I only say this one more time. Anything you want to submit in writing, please do that in advance of the meeting so that we can show that as evidence as part of the hearing. We will introduce it into the record. All right. Sorry to take up so much time. John Zimmer, I'll turn it over to you on behalf of the applicant to give us a quick little overview of this project. OK. Can I, can I, John, John, can I interrupt sure. for a second? Sure. So um, I, so Mr. Brophy is on one of these phone numbers. I asked him, um, well, I sent him an email. If, if Mr. Brophy, if you could just raise your hand so we know which phone number you are, and then that way I can promote you so we, you can at least join by audio. Sorry, sorry, John, go ahead. Okay. Um, am I able to share my screen? I hope so, yes. Okay. <laughs> Should be. Um, I, I've allowed Mr. Brophy to talk by process of elimination, Jeff, with the phone numbers here. Okay. I believe Mr. Brophy is 1658. So I've allowed him to talk if Mr. Brophy would like to talk. And, and as you see, John, you now have control of the screen. So uh, we'll, we'll let you talk us through the project. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, my name is John Zimmer with South River Environmental. Uh, this is a request for determination of applicability for a jurisdictional determination. There's no uh, actual work proposed here. It's basically uh, a request to review an area to determine whether or not it is actually an area subject to protection under the bylaw. Um, as you can see, um, this is number 35, Jerusalem Road Drive. Jerusalem Road Drive goes right along here. This is Haystack Lane. So the area is basically this isolated uh, pocket right here. There's a large retaining wall 
that's probably 10 feet or so in height. Um, and then there's additional rock outcroppings here. Um, from what I understand, back in 2014, there was a uh, filing in front of the commission where this area was identified as an isolated vegetated wetland. Um, I first became involved with the site in uh, last year in 2019, where I reviewed the area and uh, did not find the presence of hydrophytic vegetation uh, in excess of 50%, nor did I find hydric soils in the area. So, um, you know, I went back again this year and looked at it again and found the same. And what I submitted to the commission in the RDA uh, reflects the field conditions that were there in, uh, in August of this year. Um, you know, one of the questions, you know, one of the commissioners may have is, you know, has the drought affected this area? And my answer to that is no, the drought designation in the Southeast was put in place in August. So the conditions for the vegetation and, and soils were already in place at the time that the drought was um, put into effect by DEP. Additionally, as uh, the commission's aware, hydric soils take you know, a number of years to, to either form or um, you know, become uh, non-hydric. So the soil conditions really weren't affected by uh, any of the drought conditions this year. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention is that um, from speaking with Mr. Brophy and, and others, um, in, that, in 2014, this area was actually a catchment uh, for a lot of the drainage that in stormwater runoff that came from Deer Run. So there would be, um, you know, kind of a source of hydrology associated with that that would basically come down and collect in this low point. Um, uh, subsequent to 2014, there were some drainage improvements that were put in along Deer Run, and, and that um, stormwater runoff is no longer present. So that there really uh, is no source of hydrology there now either. Um, the really the groundwater doesn't get up to um, high enough to create those anaerobic conditions in the soil. Um, and we don't have the presence of hyd hydrophytic vegetation in the area anymore. So um, DEP typically looks at a, a wetland delineation as being good for three years. Um, this is kind of a prime example as to why they have that um, performance standard in there because things can change over time due to mainly in this case changes in, in hydrology. So um, all the information that, that I submitted uh, backs up the, you know, my professional determination that the area does not um, qualify for protection under the bylaw as an isolated vegetated wetland. Um, you know, I provided the, the backup data sheets in there, uh, the information on the soils and the plants and things like that. So, um, you know, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. We'd be looking for basically a negative uh, determination that the area is not subject to protection. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that the, that the commission may have. Great. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar with the, with the property. I, I will uh, give my comments in a minute, but before I do, uh, Jeff, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Jeff Summers, our agent, to give us a little bit of a, of a background on that before I provide some comments and open it up to the commission. If you'd give us any comments you have on this, Jeff Summers. Um, yeah, so what I so what I know about this is, um, like John said, it was a 2014 filing to build the house at 35 um, Jerusalem Road Drive. At the time, that area was um, identified as an isolated vegetative wetland. During the construction process, the wetland was literally removed. It was scraped down basically to, <laughs> it was scraped away, the whole wetland was gone. Um, and then what was there now um, was, um, you know, plantings for mitigation. So I think it was in maybe 2017, um, they wanted to close out the uh, NOI for the house project, but the plantings hadn't been installed. So the, then we, re we required them to actually put in the, the wetland plantings um, in that area, which they did. And then over the last, you know, few years of monitoring them, um, you know, I've never really seen it actually be a wet area, even after rains. There's, um, there is a little um, like catch basin in the, the lower right corner of that area with a pipe coming out of it, which I believe is the, yeah, down in there. Um, and I believe that pipe that comes out of that wall that John mentioned is the, um, I believe it's the, uh, um, the, the roof runoff from the house, but I, and I've never even seen water coming out of that. 
Um, so, you know, whether it was the construction of this house and the house next door and what John said um, about the, uh, the, the drainage improvements, um, you know, there just there, there isn't the hydrology there anymore to support this area as a wetland. Um, uh, you know, if, the, if there were to be, you know, further mitigation there or, uh, you know, try to, you know, do more work there to, to ma maintain this as a wetland, it would just be another failed attempt, I think, because if you don't have the proper hydrology, the, it's, it's not going to, it's not a wetland. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, with the changes that have happened there, um, you know, I, I don't think that this would really ever come back as a wetland simply because it doesn't have the water source. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, again, I have some history here. I, I was on the commission uh, back in 2013 and 14 when the NOI was put in front of it. I actually uh, had viewed this property prior to the construction when I was searching for land in Cohasset. I, I can attest to back in 2000. 12 and 13 time frame that it was very wet down the bottom there. However, only attributable to just a runoff from uh, the deep run, which is a street uh, off to the, I guess it's off to the west side there. Um, but due to the construction and the stormwater mitigation efforts from the Brophy's construction of the house and even the house next door, which you see, this looks like a little, this is probably an older photo from the springtime. Uh, without all the vegetation we have in place now, that is a newly constructed house. The commission approved that uh, construction of that house, issued them a stormwater permit. So there are infiltration chambers now capturing all the stormwater runoff. I, I went down to the site this past Saturday morning after we had our monsoon event on Friday and Friday night, and I walked the area Saturday morning to see how wet, potentially spongy it would be. It was not uh, wet at all down there, not, nothing more than what you would typically see after a little bit of a rainfall event. Uh, and again, I think this this has come a long way, as John mentioned, it doesn't, uh, there are no, um, uh, re uh, evidence of this now being an, the IBW that potentially was years ago as part of the mitigation plan. Jeff Summers, you and I actually walked out there to close out close out that order of conditions and counted each one of those little tiny little plants that were in place. So it was there. Uh, I don't doubt Mr. Zimmer's uh, assumption personally at all on this project and um, I, would, I would be in agreement with his determination. So I know I said a lot there right up front. Uh, I'll open up to the commission if anybody has any potential further comments, please do. Um, this is Mary Ann Weatherall. I'm really familiar with this property. I walked it for about eight years every day. So that area was heavily wooded um, with a, um, a, a, had a lot of wildlife, deer running through that channel, that whole that area. It was extremely wet um, and it might have been from deep run. I, I can't remember the reasoning why, but I believe there was a catch basin um, right in the center where the, the turnaround is. There was that and um, and I think alterations were made to the, the wetland or maybe it was the infil infiltration chambers placed from the new house that was built there that has captured the water now. So it's definitely not as wet as it was, but it was it, no one would turn around in that circle of Jerusalem Road Drive because it was so flooded. And, um, and you couldn't walk through there at, very well at the time, but it seems to be extremely dry and, and in, a, in an altered state, which it looks like to me. Yeah, I agree. There have been some tremendous improvements along there due to the, uh, this is a case where houses being built actually helped the stormwater drainage on the property, and of course, the, the elimination of the deep run runoff was a was a help as well. Um, other commissioners, any comments? I was down uh, yumping through there this afternoon, and I made a a point of going to, to the lowest points, um, which is sort of in the center and off to the right. And it was definitely spongy. All right, it's not hard. I live on the common. It's not like the common, which is bone dry. Um, it feels, you know, the common feels like um, plywood. This was spongy underfoot. Um, hydric soils, I didn't dig down. I, I have to take what John says as fact. But I have a question for you, John. When you've gone through the worst drought in 20 years, which we've had in the last few months, and you take these measurements, 
how do you classify something as hydric? Is it, do you look at the, the oxygen content? Because it's inherently going to be dry. It's not going to be, the hydrology is not going to be what it's going to be in a swamp where you find hydric cell. Could you talk to that point for a while, please? Sure, absolutely. When, when you're looking at the soils to determine whether or not they're hydric, you're not looking, I mean, one of, one of the factors is, is whether or not you know, they, they hold water. That, that's another one of the, the factors that you look at. But the base determination with respect to hydric or non-hydric is based on the color of the soil. So when you have a, a darker type soil with, um, you know, like a, it's like a 3-2 color, which is almost like a black soil, or you get those situations where you get groundwater for, you know, the majority of the year, you'll actually get what are called glade soils. They actually turn to gray and you can see the ribbons of orange, manganese, and iron that, that precipitate out. So, you know, whether or not the soil is actually holding water at the time that you're doing the test pit doesn't necessarily make a difference. You always go based on the soil color and there's a chart that you actually look at and there are certain numbers that represent hydric soils and certain numbers that, that are non-hydric. So that, that's how I based my determination on it. Uh, because a lot of times you'll have hydric soils that that aren't spongy or or aren't actually saturated at the time that you're looking at them. Would it make a difference to the um, person proposing this that we we would give it six months of winter rain and snow and melt and have a look at this come next spring? Because I, to be honest, I walking down there now, I felt spongy, but I, that's not a very good diagnosis of a problem after the kind of you know, uh, drought that we've had around here. I feel much comfortable having gone through a bad winter and walking down and looking at the quality of what we have there and, well, and taking a decision at that point. If, if, you, if you think about the, the growth of the vegetation within the area, there was no drought conditions right up until August. So anything that was gonna grow there in a normal season was growing there. And there was evidence of that in the area. So the plants that would grow next year, even if we had a significant winter would be the same as what was growing there. The drought didn't affect what was present for plant life in the area at the time. So in order to be a wetland under DEP's designation and the Clean Water Act Army Corps of Engineers, you need to have all three parameters. You need to have soils, hydric soils, 50% or more greater dominance by hydrophytic or wetland plants, and you have to have hydrology. And right off the bat, we don't have the hydrology there. It's, it's not there to support those hydric soil conditions. And so you, you, we, also, you also don't have the, the hydric plants. All right. Right. Well, you're right. And my data, sheet, my data sheet backs that up. I mean, there were, there were a couple of soft rush in there, but they, weren't, they were one species in the whole you know, data plot that you look at. You look at you know, all the different species that make up the, the vegetation within the area. You know, in, in my view, walking around and doing an inventory, most of the plant life I, I saw there was what I would call upland, upland plants. Plants yes. that um, are, like to grow, grow close to water, but not have wet feet. Right. They, they, and lots of things like that. The majority of the plants were, were upland indicator species. They weren't, they weren't fac or wetter, so that they don't qualify as, as yeah. hydrophytic. Okay. Any additional comments from the commission? What is the long-term plan? It's not often that we would reverse a, a property from wetland to, to, to what you're asking for. So what is the long-term vision for this property? Um, I, I'll let Mr. Brophy chime in on this, but in my discussions with him is, is there's no development proposed there. I think it's basically just to, to maybe create a grassed area for, for his kids to, to use. If, if Mr. Brophy wants to uh, address that, please do so. If not, um, I think we've, we've got a, a little bit of an answer here from Mr. Zimmer. But it, I must say, Mr. Zimmer, it looks to me like a buildable lot, is it not? Uh, don't In terms of size and location? Um, I, I'm not sure what the, what the lot requirements are, so I, I, unfortunately I can't speak to that. Okay. I, I would be uh, I'd be hard pressed to believe that that would ever be a buildable lot, uh, given that I was not ever subdivided as a as a, as a lot, et cetera. The setbacks, you know, if you're looking at the site, looking at the locust that we're looking at right now, 
it's basically almost three-sided uh, pavement. I, I don't see how anyone would be able to get a structure in there. Uh, as Mr. Zimmer mentioned, if that holds true, um, just creating some grass area down there um, is an example of wanting to have some grassy area. Um, I, I, I wouldn't doubt that. I, I would highly doubt that this would ever be a buildable lot. I've seen a lot of strange things in Cohasset, believe me. And a, lot, and a lot of people tell you something, and then six months later, there's a for sale sign. I Good don't right. envision that, 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 that this is one of them, and I, I'll, I'll put my word on that one. I'll, I'll accept that wager. So yeah. We, so we right now, we don't see any vernal pools there or storage value. Is is that what you're saying? That there's also no, there's, there's right. it's, it, the it's hydrology is 24 inches from the surface. It says a wetland has to have hydrology with 24 inches of the surface. Like, can you describe, are there any functions or value of this property right now? Well, with respect to the Wetlands Protection Act, it's, no, I mean, it's, I guess at one time it served to, to handle some of the stormwater that was coming down off a deep run, but that's no longer the case. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, what I'm saying is that it's, it's not a wetland resource area. So it, you know, it, it may provide functions and values as an upland, but it, it does not provide wetland function and value. And I think one of the issues here is that when the uh, NOI was put in place in 2014, 2015, to close that out, that, you know, it, it, it wasn't, although it may have been, uh, for whatever reason, identified as a IBW years ago, back in 2014, 15 timeframe, when the construction of the home was performed, when the mitigation planting or the landscaping plan was put in, it, it typically, it, it was not treated as, uh, as an IBW due to the characteristics and the owner um, didn't have Eric's lovely two or three page document there about what uh, species should go in there. So even at that point in time, a lot of the uh, wetlands, uh, shrubs, et cetera, that would have potentially gone in there had it been a true IBW or BBW would have gone in. So I, I think that this probably has not been treated as an IBW for years. And again, there've been some incredible, uh, I, I, I go by this site, I don't live too far. so. Uh, if you ever travel Jerusalem Road, you go in and out of that little cul-de-sac often. Um, there have been significant drainage improvements that no longer make that area the air, the wet area that it was 10, 15 years ago. And, and I, I don't doubt John Zimmer's assessment of this property. I have some um, some historic photos that can get some perspective about this, I can share my screen. Um, yeah, let me... Uh, I'm not able to do that personally here. Let's see if I can do it. Oh, yep. Uh, Jeff, oh, can you get it? There you go, sorry. Okay, good. This is uh, September of 2014. Here's the area we're talking about. Moving up, right. this is 15, uh, June of 15, start of construction. This is uh, May of 16. Right, so just, just hold it right there. Yep. Uh, no, go, go ahead, Tom, go ahead. I don't wanna, sorry to interrupt you, go ahead. Well, I would just say that it certainly looks like uh, anything, any hydro soils that might've been here have been um, at least damaged, if not removed, by 17, uh, April of 17, you can see that this had all been cleared, resodded, some trees planted. So it all happened over a period of three years to go from essentially wooded area to a lawn. Right. Okay. If I can turn that off. Thank you. Yeah. How do I do this? Um, further comments from the commission? Do we have any uh, monitoring the Q&A here? I don't see any, any, any questions from the audience here. I don't see anything, any comments from the audience. Okay. Um, Jeff, as far as any ruling goes on this, what would be required? Uh, excuse me, what would be required for an RDA? 
Um, I just want to say, uh, Mr. Brophy was trying to, to comment. I don't know if uh, he was muted before. I don't know if he's unmuted and wants to say something. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and thanks to everyone in the commission. No, I was just coming in just to say at that point in time that uh, it's not a bit of a lot. And all we want to do is just to really clean it up and have it a space that we can use for our family, for our kids. We have uh, five kids and a uh, pretty tight space up on top. So that's purely that's the only sort of motive and reason that we have. So just to just to make that point to the commission. And, and uh, Mr. Brophy, can I just ask you, um, there are some pretty mature trees that are around the edge of the property there. They look like some uh, beautiful pine trees and some of the other mature trees. If there were any, uh, as you mentioned, any disturbance to just re basically replace lawn with, with nicer looking lawn, um, I assume that n none of the mature trees would ever be touched down there. Yeah, that's that's fair to say, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, sorry, Jeff. Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't see any comments in the Q and A about uh, from the public. Okay. Regarding this. All right. So this is an RDA. What uh, what's what would be the determination on this, Jeff? Um, so it would actually be two. It would be a negative four. Um, and I'll, I'll just read that. So a negative four determination states the work described in this request will not with it is not within an area subject to protection under the act, the Wetlands uh, Protection Act, including the buffer zone. Um, therefore, said work does not require that the, does not require the filing of a notice of intent unless, unless and until said work alters an area subject to protection under the act. So that basically, basically says, um, you know, this isn't a wetland, the state act doesn't apply. Um, and then a negative six determination is uh, basically states <clears throat> The area and or work described in the request is not subject to review and approval by, then it would be town of Cohasset and then town of Cohasset wetlands protection bylaw. So it would be negative four and negative six. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, any further comment from the commission? Okay, Jay Pimpari would like to make a motion to issue a negative four and a negative six determination for the property located at 35 Jerusalem Road Drive. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Mr. Eisenhower. We will do this by roll call vote. When I state your name, please say yay or nay um, for uh, approval uh, of the project or uh, in agreement with the negative four, negative six determination. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Uh, Tr uh, Eric Eisenhower. Aye. Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Chris McFarlane. Chris McFarlane, aye. Jay Pimpare, aye. Mary Ann. They're all aye. That vote passes six to zero. Congratulations. Good luck with the uh, with whatever endeavors you decide to do over there. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, while I'm uh, reading into the record or talking about 76 Lambert's Lane, could you please promote uh, the individuals that uh, that will be speaking on behalf of uh, of the project this evening? Sure. So the next the next item of business is uh, 76 Lambert's Lane. This is an NOI 20-19 stormwater permit 20-26 for a sports court by Mr. McKetty Machetti, excuse me. Um, uh, for the record, I just want to let everybody know I did listen. To, I was not in attendance for the last meeting. Uh, I did listen to the tape. It was a very healthy discussion. I have listened to the tape. I've watched the Zoom session twice, in fact, and I have signed an affidavit to the fact that I have listened to the Zoom tape and I will be eligible to uh, participate in the hearing tonight. Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to, at this time, recuse myself from this hearing. Noted. Thank you very much. Mr. McFarlane has recused himself from the 76 Lambert's Lane hearing. 
Uh, we are now down to five uh, voting members and have a quorum. I do just want to make a note for anybody listening tonight, uh, the, which I should have said this earlier on, the NOI for 183, 187 Atlantic Ave, the boardwalk by the Fernandos, it will be continued until our next hearing of, uh, of November. Uh, okay, so if anyone's hanging around on the phone waiting for 183 Atlantic Ave, the boardwalk, we will not be entertaining any comments. We will not entertain the application. The applicant has asked for a continuance, and so that application will be continued. The board will not be discussing, or the commission will not be discussing anything with respect to 183 Atlantic Ave until our next meeting in October. Okay, uh, Jeff, I'll turn it back to you here. If we could, looks like we've brought up uh, a bunch of the uh, attendees now to become panelists. And I will turn it over to uh, to the applicant to to give us an overview. And Jeff, if you could probably either put up one of two, put up the landscaping plan, or put up the engineering plan. We have I, I've noticed on the web page those seem to be. Um, hopefully, everyone's had a chance to view it. There were two recently submitted plans: uh, the landscaping plan earlier in the week, and the engineering plan uh, was just submitted a, a day or so ago. Uh, I have had a chance to view those and. Again, Jeff, if you could bring those up on your computer, that would be great. Uh, sure. One second. So Kara has her hand raised. She said that she, um, or that she is. Got it. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, so I'll just say that uh, for, for Steve or Kara, um, you should be able to share your screens. I don't know if it'd be easier for you. Um, or, yeah, I, or, if, or if not, I can put the site plans up. Yeah, if you want, I can start if uh, we want to go with the site plan, which will give more of an overview, and then Kara can zoom in on her uh, landscape design component. Uh, so if I can share my screen now, um, let, me get, uh, let me get the site plan up for you. And Try this and okay. Um, so hopefully you can see what's on the screen at the moment. Um, yeah. All right. So for the record, uh, this is Steve Giosa with SciTech Engineering, and I am representing Dr. Lambert, uh, Dr. Lambert, Dr. Uh, Marchetti this evening. Uh, this is 76 Lambert's Lane. Um, just for orientation, this is the existing dwelling and pool area on the property. Uh, there is a bordering vegetated wetland uh, also located on the property, uh, shaded in green just off on the right side of the uh, exhibit. Uh, we've also highlighted the 50 foot uh, buffer zone, no activity zone line on the plan. And we've highlighted the 100 foot jurisdictional buffer zone line uh, as well. So those uh, jurisdictional lines have, uh, were established some, uh, back on the original filing and are depicted on the plan. I think as the commission members recall at the last meeting, uh, we did have a discussion about alternatives for uh, uh, Dr. Marchetti's plan to construct a sport court. And at the time a uh, fire, there was originally a fire pit and patio area and then a raised planting bed, uh, beds on the property. Um, the commission clearly expressed their concerns about some of these activities being proposed within the 50 foot no activity zone. Uh, so we did look at alternatives. I think Kara had looked at a number of options for other locations, which we discussed at the last meeting. Um, and then after that, uh, the team got together and we looked at other alternatives, including downsizing the project a little bit. Um, and shifting some of the elements of the design on the property, as well as uh, bolstering the stormwater management system to get us um, below pre-development levels. So some of the things we did was we looked at reducing the size, which we did, of the sport court, and we did shift it in a northerly direction so that the uh, original alignment had the sport court or a corner of the sport court extending into the 50 foot no activity zone. Um, we have now shifted it so we are completely out of that zone. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, we also eliminated the patio area and uh, seating area for the fire pit and replaced it with a play set area, which will be located in this gray shaded area on the property. Again, outside of the 50 foot uh, no activity zone uh, portion of the site. And then we reconfigured the raised planting beds uh, that are proposed out in the lower portion of the southern portion of the uh, proposed activity. So those have now been positioned here uh, on the property. So we have pulled the proposed activity out of the 50 foot zone. Uh, you'll notice we're still showing some green shading here and this will be more for Kara to discuss when we get to her portion of the presentation, but there are replacement plantings or mitigation plantings proposed along this edge uh, and in several other areas on the property so that um, we are still showing this as an area that was, I think as the commission members went out there saw, had been cut as the contractor was working on solar panels, which exist in this location here on the site. And, uh, and so since there is gonna be some planting here, uh, what we are proposing is to install the erosion control barrier uh, along this line so that any digging for the tree planting occurs there is at least a barrier along the edge of what has already been cleared on the site, all the way down and around the corner and along the northern edge of the work area. So we think from an erosion control standpoint, we have that um, in place uh, that would be set prior to the start of any of the uh, activities that the commission may approve. Um, for stormwater management, we took another look at what we had proposed for mitigation and the original plan uh, was really limited to a small filter strip uh, running along the perimeter of the uh, sport court area. We found that that did not provide us with sufficient volume mitigation or peak flow mitigation. And it was really a minor increase in the original application, but uh, the commission was very clear that even that minor increase was uh, not an acceptable option. So. We took another look at it. We decided to go with some Cultec recharge units. Uh, we've got a total of 12 proposed. Uh, we've put a, a row of eight here and an additional four in this location. The entire perimeter uh, recharge system is all interconnected. So it functions as a single system. Uh, we've added a detail for the construction where we would excavate place a six inch washed crushed stone base. The units with crushed stone going and extending a foot either side. The unit itself is a three foot wide unit and about 20 inches high. Then we would put six inches of crushed stone above that. And then a piece stone um, top layer with filter fabric running along the perimeter edges to keep the soil particles from uh, flushing in and uh, potentially impacting the uh, effectiveness of the system. And then we finally put a couple of observation ports or inspection ports uh, so that we can monitor the long-term effectiveness of uh, the system. So we've got an inspection port here and one up in this location here. So we can monitor how the water drains through the system and whether or not it's uh, continuing to uh, maintain its effectiveness as a recharge system. The one thing we have as a disadvantage on this site, as you might expect, is a uh, high ledge layers and also D-class hydrologic soil group soils. So those soils are not really conducive for a recharge. So when we run the analysis, we really run it with a very, very minor uh, exfiltration rate uh, associated with this site. Um, even given the extensive bottom area and side area we have for available uh, recharge, we really want to be conservative in that regard. Um, and with that uh, addition to the uh, stormwater system, we have submitted a new uh, stormwater summary sheet, which uh, outlines the fact that we are below pre-development um, peak flows and pre-development runoff volume rate uh, levels uh, to be in compliance with your uh, regulations in that regard. So I think we've made some improvements from our initial plan and even from our secondary plan. 
And uh, I think I will at this point maybe stop sharing unless the commission members have some questions and let Kara add, or hopefully she can display her exhibits that go a little more detail on the planting element um, that is proposed as part of the project. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, happy to uh, share, happy to have Kara share her screen in, in a moment. Um, just wanted to focus in on the physical placement of, of everything here and a couple questions on that. Have you talked to um, the, the zoning uh, uh, building inspector, et cetera, regarding setbacks for the tennis courts here and what are the setbacks? It, it, it looks apparent it's right up against the property line of, uh, of the abutters in the back of the property. Uh, what, what are the setbacks and have you looked at the setbacks and talked to zoning on that? The, the closest point on the setback is five feet. Um, and again, it is not technically a structure under zoning. Um, so uh, the closest point would be at this corner here. And then it does angle away to a, probably about 10 or 12 feet in this location here. Again, the only uh, element that is above grade essentially is the fence itself. Other than that, it's just the surface treatment of this. There are no structures, there's no sheds or enclosures that are being proposed here that might rise uh, to the level of a, of a zoning encroachment issue. So we believe we're in compliance um, with the zoning okay. setback requirements. Um, Jake, I, I, go ahead, Jeff. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on that point. So I, I did speak with uh, Bob Egan, the building commissioner, um, you know, asking, I asked, basically asked the same thing because I saw that was so close there. Um, he said that as long as the fence is below 15 feet, that it can be built up to six feet to the property line. So as long as the fence is what now? Below 15 feet that it can be built up to six feet to the property line. When I spoke okay. to him, he had said up to the property line, if you wanted to you know, make it safe, it could be six feet. But the technical rule, when I asked him, even last year and then recently, it was up to the property line because the fence you could put right on the property line and it wasn't a structure. So he said, if you wanted to be safe, you could do six, but technically you could go right up to it. And that was just a couple of weeks ago I asked. Okay, so it's, it, it, a little, it's out of our um, jurisdiction, but I do want to, um, I, uh, I want to make that, uh, question that. Um, and it was a question that was in the Q&A as well uh, after. Um, so I, I make, want to make sure that I address that. Um, I see that the proposed fence is a 10 foot high fence, is that, around the entire area of the tennis court or is just on one side? Uh, it is a 10 foot fence, but I think I'll let Kara or Dr. Marchetti answer the specifics of it. Okay. And I, I would just say one more thing here. Um, I've, I've researched what structures are. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would question the town's response on that. We had a situation where a basketball court was questioned on whether it was a structure. And lo and behold, a basketball court or a court of any nature was considered a structure. So I uh, just want to put that on the record. But I'm, I'm ha it, it, it's, uh, any questions with the, with the physicalness of this plan before we get to the landscaping plan, which I think hopefully will we'll answer some other questions from the commission or Jeff, any questions on, on placement here? Uh, uh, you know, Steve, Eric Eisenhower here. Um, where is a wildlife easement on this map? Okay, so it essentially we ran it right down the silt fence line. So this dashed line you see here is the easement line. The easement line. That's also, so you're, you're building right on top of the, uh, the silt fence is going right on top of the easement line, correct? Yeah, so that's basically coincides with what was cleared uh, previously. That clearing is right up to here and then there'll be obviously with this shifting of the court a little further to the north there will be some additional clearing but we did keep that away from the line uh, in this location but from an erosion control standpoint we ran the the silt fencing right down the line yeah. but the physical activity is pulled back away from the line 
So there will be no um, no sign of physical activity on the wildlife side of that line. The wildlife that's correct. Um, that that's correct, and and we've staked it out. I would anticipate staking it again in case some of those stakes have disappeared prior to any construction. Okay. So again, when we put a silt sock down on the ground, it's kind of like the line in the sand. When the silt sock is put in there, there's obviously no work to be done on the other side of the silt sock. And as I understand, the silt sock would go along the line of the wild out, wildlife easement, which obviously would um, would prohibit any work from being done in the easement itself, correct? That's correct. Okay. Mr. Chairman, when would you yes. like to discuss there was a discussion of 30 trees being cut down in the easement and in the um, the buffer zone when we met last. Is yeah. that a subject you want to hold off or can we discuss that now? Well, I think that's a good a segue into the landscaping plan. Okay. And we'll, uh, so thank you very much. All that's right. why you, you're going to make a great chair one day, Eric. I know. Yeah, wait till about eight o'clock. Uh, so I would like to, uh, Jeff, if we could have Kara share her screen if possible, and go over and discuss the landscaping plan as to the improvements and any possible mitigation, et cetera. Hello? Can you anyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay. That's great. Um, so Jeff, I have this um, duality of screens here. So I have my, my phone, which you can see me using, but I'm unable to share my screen unless- Yep, that's okay, I can, I can do it. Okay. Give me one second. Let me find this. Do you want to do it, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I have it up. Okay. I have it up here. I have it here as well. All right. If you got, if you have it, Jay, why don't you do it? Because I have a bunch of screens open too. It might be easier. Okay. Can you see it now? Um, okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, so I apologize, I'm gonna to have to jump around a little bit on this one because it's such a large file and a lot of it is small. So I'll, I'll scroll down, but I'd rather just stay at the top and, and, and scroll down from there. So apologize if uh, for the size of it, maybe I can blow it up a little bit more here for everybody. And so I'll, I'll let you take it away, Kara. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, Justin. Um, so this is the first page of a four page document. So if you actually zoom out, we can go through it page by page. So okay. this first, yes, so this first um, plan is just the overall plan. Um, I drew this prior to Steve revising his um, layout for the court. So you will notice that the court is not in the position, um, the finalized position. Um, regarding the plant list, um, you will, I, I've, I've written actually a memorandum uh, and also a plant list that is printable. Um, that's a separate file. Um, but essentially, I'm proposing to install 41 mitigation trees, 137 shrubs, um, 1,200 perennials to the site along the wildlife border. Um, if we can go to the next page, I can go through it um, in detail. Um, so this first sheet shows the tennis court um, border. Um, it's along the border of the wildlife easement. Um, I currently have placed um, Aronia arbutifolia, which is red choke cherries along the, the wildlife edge um, in the event that there is disturbance. Um, I have currently placed them on the right-hand side of the wildlife easement. Um, according to the revised plans from Steve, um, these, these shrubs would be placed within um, Dr. Marchetti's uh, property, which is on the left of the wildlife easement. Um, every, um, all of the mitigation plants are actually in color so that you can um, see the 
amount of mitigation planting in relation to the non-mitigation planting. Okay. Um, so for, Excuse me, could you define what you mean by mitigation? What are you trying to achieve? The mitigation plants were chosen off of the principal native plant species list for the South Shore. Um, this was the list that I was given by Jeff Summers um, in order to do the mitigation planting plan. So I all the plants- uh, my, my question is, what, are you, what problem are you trying to mitigate by- the, What problem am I trying to mitigate? Um, the deforestation of the site. Okay. So I, I, I think what's, uh, so I, what I get out of this is what I'm, what I'm hearing off the top here is um, the landscape plan appears to be submitted uh, earlier in the week, if not last week. So thank you for the, the timely submittal of that. However, the engineering plan was submitted after the landscaping plan. And what I'm seeing here is the landscaping plan does not match the engineering plan. Uh, for a couple of things here, one being that the, the court itself is not, um, is not right up against the property line pretty much, which it, it is on the, uh, on the other site. And then secondly, it is the, um, what we have here is mitigation plantings, which are actually in the easement area itself, while uh, on the engineering plan, they're shown on the other side of the easement itself on, within the silt sock. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Yes, that is correct. So please use the engineer's plans in terms of the layout of the court. Um, the mitigation plants would, will be on the left side of the wildlife easement line. Um, this was not. Right. Was so not if you can see. I was, right. Right. Okay. All right. So we'll circle back to that. You want me to uh, coming down to page three here? Or are we still on page two? Um, yeah, you can just scroll down this page. Um, you will notice that everything in color again is a, is part from the native plant species list. Yep. Um, I've used um, a, a very vast variety of trees. For example, there is red maple, yellow birch, paper birch, um, eastern red cedar, American holly, and eastern white pine. Um, for the shrubs, uh, everything from service berry, red choke cherry, uh, witch hazel, ink berry, winter berry, bay berry, and low bush blueberry. Um, these plants were selected for their um, ability to withstand drier site conditions um, and also their fast growth rate. Many of these shrubs selected have um, a wonderful berry uh, production uh, value. Um, for example, the low bush blueberries will um, produce fruit in the summer months, while the ink berries, winter berries, um, will have fruit during the winter, obviously. Okay. Uh, if we, can, we can go to the next page. So as we get further um, south of the court, um, I've used... Um, I've, I've pretty much used many shrubs hugging the border of the wildlife easement. Um, and I've done this even to the front lawn areas. Okay. All right. Um, and then if you go to the following page, which is the last one, um, I've actually um, put in additional trees to, um, along either sides of the, of the lawn areas. And I've done this because there was a wetland, a designated wetland on the left side of the property. Um, so on the left, you can see that there is a variety of trees selected such as red maple, yellow birch and paper birch um, with an understory layer of blueberries and winter berries. Um, there's also a ground cover layer of butterfly weeds, uh, milk weeds, and asters, along with haste-scented ferns. Okay. 
All right, I'm going to jump back to the uh, to the front page to, to this page here to, to page one uh, before. So I think it captures the entire um, project here, at least as an overview. Um, Jeff Summers, do you have any comments before I open it up to the commission and make my own comments here? Um, yeah, so, but, uh, so I don't know if, well, my comments about the plantings were, um, so first of all, you know, be, because of all of the work here in the buffer zone, you know, trying to, um, you know, minimize well, it's disturbed, but you know, in the event, you know, assuming this was an undisturbed lot, in order to minimize the disturbance in the buffer zone, um, you know, personally, I would like, you know, to see, you know, this play area, this the um, raised garden beds, to be moved, um, you know, further to the east to allow replanting in the in the, uh, you know, fifty to hundred, uh, which would be to the east of that. So that's that's my opinion. I think that would be beneficial to the to the, to the obviously to the buffer zone. Uh, you know, you'd be minimizing some grass area in the hundred foot um, and replant on the east side of of the um, playground and the the garden area. And then additionally, you know, looking at this, um, you know, you don't have a lot of room to work with. But like on the north side of the uh, court, you know, you, you're coming right up against the property line. I don't know if it's, if you have the soil, I know, and it's outside the buffer zone, I understand. Um, you know, I think in that area, if it's possible to plant some trees, uh, just for the sake of the neighbor's view, um, you know, something that would, you know, be at least 10 feet tall and cover the fence. Um, I think, you know, aesthetically from their standpoint, I think that'd be beneficial as well. Um, those are really my only comments on the plantings. Um, if we need to get back to stormwater, I, I do have a question about that, but we can we can wait on that. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, Carr, this is Eric Eisenhower. Um, I've checked all your plants. Your plants are off of our list, so that's fine. Correct. Um, issue aside, is your choice of birch trees? The trees you have chosen are very very susceptible to bronze birch borer. They don't plant those trees typically in the Cohasset area because of the disease spread. There are one or two birches um, that are planted here that are very resistant to this very common disease. So white uh, paper birch, yellow birch, typically are not planted here because of the prevalence of the disease. And it's up to you what you put in. It's not really our, our problem, but uh, I think you might want to reconsider your choice of birches. The, the river birch, the heritage river birch is the tree of choice, which is very disease resistant. So it's up to you, but it's not a, it's not a, a conservation issue as such. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Mary Ann with Paul. They had some comments to add to that. Go ahead, Mary Ann. First, um, on the inspection port, I guess it's, you say that you're going to watch it. So I, I guess I'd like a condition that there is regular reports coming in so we can monitor the water from that and um, make sure it's working effectively. Um, second, I was concerned, and I know it's not our area, but um, the court being so close to the property line, I, I think it's usually supposed to be 20 feet, I think, but I'm not sure about that. Um, often structures such as tennis courts are used as disturbed areas to turn into house foundations. So I just just really am concerned that it's, I mean, maybe it, it could be turned into something eventually and it's too close. Um, I was interested in learning more about the um, the play set and the fire pit. Um, what is it made of? Just tell me more about that and does it need to be there? Um, and I, I like what you're doing with your planting plan. I just, I want to make sure that it looks like a natural forest um, and it acts like a natural forest since so much was taken away from the wildlife that inhibited the area. So those were my initial thoughts on that. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. 
I I want to uh, I want I know we have a, a comment in the Q and A which I'll get to in a minute. I I want to make the comment to go back to to Eric's comment and what it has been really what's brought us here um, to this discussion, which has dragged this out a little bit as far as timing goes, is due to the removal of some of the vegetation trees etc that had occurred within um, within the hundred foot buffer zone. So. You know, what I see here is, well, first off, I've already made the note that the landscape plan does not match the engineering plan, which, which is a concern that needs to be corrected. Secondly, I think that as far as mitigation goes, that I would like to see more of mitigation on the, what looks like the, I guess, uh, the, the bordering side, of, well, two sides of the actual um, tennis court here. The side that, uh, that, that, that adjoins the abutting property, it looks like there is a 10-foot uh, fence there. Uh, we have in the past, and you remember down at the Toll Estates where somebody was putting in a, a stone wall, a riprap wall, and due to the aesthetics of the situation, we had required the owner to put in some form of vine over the uh, riprap wall. And I see that this is a, would be another example of where we could do that. But not only vines in the place there, but I would personally like to see um, some type of mitigation where we see trees that are of eight or 10 feet tall placed in there that are gonna grow to uh, provide coverage for that area. But much, much more, more important is the coverage between the uh, tennis court in the actual, uh, easement area itself. What I see there is some two gallon uh, plants uh, appear to be just that plants. Maybe they'll be small shrubs, but what you have now is a 10 foot fence. And I would, you've done, I'll, I'll applaud the uh, Carol for giving a very in-depth landscaping plan outside of the 100 foot buffer zone that is not really within our jurisdiction, but you've gone I think you've gone above and beyond as far as outside the 100 foot wetland, but I would like to see uh, the restoration be really focused in mitigation within the 100 foot uh, wetland area. And that's what this Conservation Commission is tasked with. And, and the reason that primarily this project hasn't been approved, probably would have been approved a meeting or two ago had the disturbance not been there because we we're hung up on the mitigation planting. And I, I think that the mitigation plan in, along the uh, easement area needs to be beefed up a lot more than what it is right now. And I'm getting a sense from, from listening to the last hearing and, and Eric's comments bringing us into that, that others feel the same way. So I'll, I'll open up to other commissioners, but I think that the planting plan needs to be beefed up in the hundred. Yeah, Jay, that's that's basically what what I was kind of um, uh, trying to get to too, with with you know moving the the playground and the raised garden beds further to the the west to allow more room for mitigation in the buffer zone. And I'm yeah, so I appreciate that. I agree, totally agree with that. And I'm I don't know if you can see my cursor. You see my cursor now. Yeah, and, and, and along in that area as well. Yep. Yeah. So that's where that's my primary focus that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned that again, if it's right up against the property line, it really doesn't give you much area uh, to move. I think that needs to be figured out. We we cannot approve a project where the landscaping plan is off is X amount of feet off of the um, the the bordering property, but yet the engineering plan is virtually up against the property there. So that's a discrepancy that needs to be um, corrected. And again, this this area here, I, I would like to see it, it beefed up a little bit more on the engineering plan. The tennis court has moved over a little bit. And I'll, I'll jump to the, I'll jump to that because I have that right here. You know, there, there is, there's a buffer here. There, there's, I don't know what the distance is on the engineering plan, but there is a buffer and there's room to plant some trees there. And I, I would like to see more of a buffer there. And, and I know you're, you've got the inspection port here, so that might be a little difficult, but if there was a buffer and or 
the uh, fence could be aesthetically more pleasing to the neighbors, I think that would go a long way. We, we, we still have yet to address mitigation for the destruction or the removal of uh, vegetation, trees, etc. cetera. Okay. And, and Jeff, I, be, uh, Jeff I, I, uh, before I forget, uh, the comment was lengthy. Would you like to read into the record here the comment from uh, Coroner Martinez, please? Karina. Sure. Um, so Can you do that? It's, a, it's actually Susan Hoadley. Um, so she, okay, so she sent us a, um, a comment over the Q&A. So I'll just read that. It'll take me um, just a couple minutes. Um, so so Susan Hoadley saying that um, she's the abutter at 175 Hall Street, um, the house, the property to the north. Um, she says, we would like to oppose the application for the same reasons that have been expressed by members of the board. In the unlikely event that permitting is granted in the location up against our property line, we would like to propose significant mitigation. This request comes from the desire, <clears throat> excuse me, to restore our enjoyment of the damaged wildlife buffer and the unpermitted grading, filling, and deforestation of the 100 foot buffer. We would propose that lighting be excluded from the project and that mature 15 to 20 foot trees uh, plantings be placed so that the view from our house to the new paved and lit area will be at least partially mitigated. We would invite members of the board to tour the site from our viewpoint of the property and see what the effect of the unpermitted clearing of the buffer has <clears throat> had on our property. As the conservation relevant concerns may be hard to imagine from the job site. And that's all. Okay. Thank you. Eric, were you trying to get a comment in there? Well, first point is I, I was trying to get Jeff to make it larger so I could read it, but that's okay. Uh, Jeff read it and, and that's fine. Um, this whole plan is very pretty, Carr, and I say that with great respect. All right. I know landscaping and plants and all that, but we're missing the point here. We have a major need for replication of the buffer zone and of the easement area where trees have been cut down in an unauthorized way. Now, our job here is to go back and replicate whatever has to be replicated. You need to put trees back tree by tree to recreate what was taken out. Now, uh, in our last meeting, we talked about 30 trees being eliminated. I think that's, that's, a, that's a figure I work with right now that were cut down. So I wanna see one by one replacement for those 30 trees in either a buffer zone or an easement area or a replication of those in a new buffer area or easement. That's what the rules demand, okay? And um, I, f the first thing I would like to see is a plan from um, Steve, which is an engineering diagram, which shows where all the trees were cut down. The trees that were under underneath the sports court, I'm not too concerned about because they would have to be cut down or eliminated anyways, I guess, or they're not gonna go back there. But there are lots of trees in the, um, I believe, uh, in the 100, the 50, and in the easement area that were cut down, we could see stacks of wood. And you know we have to go back and find out where these were, and then we have to replicate the wetlands and the buffer zone and the easement area which have been disturbed and altered. That's our responsibility. All the other things we're talking about are nice sort of building development projects, but our job is to protect the wetland area and to protect the naturalness of this site. So what I would request is a, a drawing showing where these 30 trees are from or whatever the number is, all right? And um, you may not know where each one is, but I think we have to do the best job and we have to replicate the wetlands in the easement area in the process that we're going through. That's what we're, that's what we're charged with on the Conservation Commission. And until we get into that, I don't, I don't have a lot of time to spend on pools and everything else, because that's all development. Our job is to protect the environment and the wetlands and the trees and the nature. That's, that's what we have to do. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. We need to locate where those trees were. We need to go back 
and we have to do a replication program. As you know, it's well defined in the Cohasset Wetland Regulations. Up, oh, can't hear you, Steve. You're muted. Um, I, I will Eric, turn it over. Also, work with the tree warden in town to conduct a tree inventory too. I mean, that's yeah. an option. Make okay. It so, so, in terms of uh, depicting the pre-development or the pre-clearing conditions, we wouldn't have a survey that would depict each and every tree that might have been there at the time of the initial clearing. I mean, that's just data we would not normally have collected in a, in a site like this. We clearly, I think, can estimate the limits of those uh, clearing areas. The pre-clearing tree line can be reestablished. And I think if the commission has, I think, reached the conclusion that it's about a 30 tree um, impact that has occurred, um, we can outline the area in which that has occurred and show that on a plan for the commission. And then I guess that would dictate a little bit of what you're talking about for where you want to focus replication or restoration. Maybe I'd ask Marianne. I know Marianne brought up, and I don't mean to pin you down, Marianne, but you used the figure 30, and I, I couldn't quite remember where that figure came from. Um, but someone, I think, had gone out and counted the stumps. Is that where it came from at the last meeting? Question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I didn't count them. That's why I'm recommending the tree warden. I mean, I think yeah. you can quickly identify with the stumps um, and how many were cut down or, or yeah. observation of looking better, maybe at the, uh, the logs themselves. I think in other um, conservation commissions, they often use the tree warden as a reference. Okay. Yeah, I I, th I think the applicant could could easily uh, doing a tour of the site see the physical stumps that are currently there now. We have some great photographs that show those stumps. It's a question of as Eric had alluded to the exact location of those stumps and where they were with respect to the 50 foot buffer, the 100 foot buffer, the wildlife easement in general. So. Uh, I'm in full support of Eric's recommendation. I think that was uh, alluded to at the last hearing and been brought up again. I, I think now where we're at is, is just to do that, is to address the mitigation aspects of this proposal. Uh, I, Carrie, you've done a, a great job with, yeah. with, with color, coordinating, color coordinating all of this. And again, applaud you for the, for the work uh, outside the, the 100 foot buffer zone. My, my comment is that it needs to be beefed up inside the 100 foot buffer zone as some form of replication, whether it's 20 trees, 25 trees, 30 trees, whatever it is. Those were extremely uh, mature trees. Maybe a couple of them did come down in the, in the windstorm, whatever, you know, um, but they seem to be very mature and somewhat healthy uh, over the photographs and, and the site visit. So uh, again, along the side of the tennis court, along the abutting property, and as Jeff mentioned, along the proposed uh, set area, play set area, et cetera, that I think that more mature trees, not the smaller of the shrubs, uh, there seems to be room to do that by looking at the engineering plan. Um, so I think you just need to, uh, um, I, I know that you, you know, you're just the designer here, uh, someone else is cutting the cutting the check, but I have to have the meeting of the minds and come up with a suitable mitigation plan in order for the commission to at least at least me to 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 make any um, decision on this project. The uh, historic photos again from Google Earth give us a really good picture of what was there. Uh, okay. the April of 2017. Uh, there's no leaves on the trees, so you can you can get a pretty reasonable count of the trees that existed in 2017. If you'd like to see them, I've got it up on my screen. But Steve, there is a requirement. There is a two for one, all right, replication ratio, all right, for every foot that has been um, disturbed. You have to put in two feet of buffer zone or easement. That's the that's the rules. So this is going, it's not going to be a small effort. We want to see similar trees. We don't want to see flowering cherries. We want to see trees that reflect the habitat in the area that we're taking down. We need to look at the soil, which has been compacted. 
And you'll see in the protocol, um, section 32, uh, uh, section C, the protocol you have to go through in a replication exercise. So it's not just saying, I wanna put 10 trees over here. There are procedures, there's engineering diagrams. You have to quantify the type of soil. There are photographs to be taken. There's a lot of work that goes into this if we're gonna do this right. And you have to decide where you're gonna put it because you can't put 30 trees into that forest now that's already got the stumps and all that. You're gonna to have to expand in the under, other areas of the garden, I believe. So uh, we're just beginning this, I'm afraid. You know, we're not near the end by any means. Uh, comments from any of the commissioners? Okay. Um, I have a few comments. Go ahead, <laughs> we'll get a yes. This is zone, the court is shrunk down width-wise as much as you can go otherwise, there's no court. Um, I thought we were charged with trying to not alter the easement. So that's why we didn't sneak any trees in kind of to the right of the court and to the left of the easement line. It'd be great to put them in there. I had I've spoken with the neighbor many times on what trees she would like along that fence line. I have updated every step of the way. Um, so you, you get a snippet of a comment or two at a meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, yeah. I could hear all the comments back and forth. Very mm -hmm. nice emails. We decided what kind of trees, the height of the trees, all that. Um, I agree we can add more in that playground area in between the court and the playground. The playground was just, it was half trying to move another large yeah surface away from that area and move it move out of this project um, so there's there's room to put more trees there I, yeah. I, I must admit mr Marquette, it's not entirely clear in the wording of the easement what you do when the easement's been partially cut down and you have to go back in and plant trees you're supposed to stay out of it that's something we're going to have to i think uh maybe possibly get some legal determination on that as to where we stand on jay do you have any thoughts on that um, I think I'd like to, you know, uh, I know that uh, we continue this and we continue this and I understand the, the applicant uh, does obviously keeps coming back and, and, and gets comments from the commission. Uh, I would I would encourage and we'll have to get some direction um, from legal counsel as well, but I, I would encourage the applicant to work more closely with the um, with our, and I'm running out of my battery here, more closely with our conservation agent to come to some resolution. Jeff made some great comments at the beginning, and I think he knows exactly the commission's feelings here on what needs to be done and how we need to go about doing that. So I would encourage the applicant to, uh, to work with our agent a little bit more closely. He understands exactly what needs to be done here so that when we come back in two weeks, if we come back in two weeks, that there's a, a, a better diagram picture landscaping plan and that we can come, you know, move this forward a little bit. So that's my recommendation. Okay, yeah, and I had mentioned about the pile of wood. There was a, a large amount of wood that came from a large distance away from this area. And I had sent that information along after the previous meeting. So you, again, can't just look at the large pile of wood that majority of it didn't come from this clearing uh, and more than a few trees were lost in the storms. Uh, the stumps, the large pine stumps are those that came down in the storms. They weren't, you know, that, that part was mother nature a little bit. Jeff, do you have any comments on this? Um, yeah, I mean, like as, as far as, you know, uh, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, so Karis is our, our um, special town council that we go to with questions about um, um, legal issues regarding, um, you know, conservation. <clears throat> I, I, I imagine if I proposed to her this question of, you know, what to do with the disturbed area inside the um, wildlife habitat easement, I imagine her response would be to just replant it. I don't know what more... Okay. We need to know other than that. 
that's probably better than nothing, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so another issue I, I want to, Jeff, if you could follow up with and work with the applicant as far as the setbacks regarding the structure of uh, tennis courts, et cetera, and fencing that goes along with that. Yeah, I'll get something in writing from uh, the building department. Okay, great. And, and I will refer you back to um, the email that Mr. Henderson wrote. Uh, Rich Henderson, we can talk about this offline, but Rich Henderson put together something with respect to the cemetery, not the cemetery, the church, uh, down the end of uh, the Greek church, down the end of Straits Pond, when we were questioning whether or not a foundation was an actual structure. And so there's a, a memo floating around. I was trying to find it online right now, but I couldn't. But there's a memo floating around, and it cites exactly what the uh, what a structure is in accordance with all the codes. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, Kara, yes. I, yes, I did have. A, I just wanted to recap on a few items. Um, so, Eric, you had mentioned that you would like the <clears throat> replanting of the buffer zone to replicate the the forest, the adjacent forest. Um, this was not made known to me. Um, I was given the principal native plant species uh, list, um, which I selected all the plants from. Um, had I known that that was a criteria, that is something that I would definitely have addressed uh, for this meeting. Um, all right. all right. Let me just say, you've done a good job. Your, your, what you've done so far is first class except we're moving into a different geographical area, which is the right side, all right, where the trees were cut down, which is true buffer zone, wild area. And I think what we have to do there is probably um, uh, a bit more complicated in terms of creating a natural environment than what you've done on the other part, okay? So I, I, you know, I think you've done a great job in, in what's been done. We just have a bit more work to do, Cara, all right? Okay. Uh, I don't see any further questions, Q&A from the audience. Further comments from the commission? Okay. I think that um, we, we have some to-dos. and some heading team trying to fix this and work with us and within the conditions and, and the bylaws. So um, I know it's taking longer than you think, but it, it will all be very much better in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And again, you know, we're we're trying to um, we're trying to do our job here, what we're tasked with, and it's certainly it's not easy. Uh, again, as Eric had alluded to, the landscaping plan is is looks like a great plan. It needs some more beefing up, and uh, and specifically within the 100 foot buffer and to the issues that we had raised. So there is some to-dos here, but I, I would encourage you to reach out to Jeff Summers, our conservation agent. He can guide you along the way. As commissioners, we cannot uh, interact with you prior to the next hearing, but Jeff, uh, if there are any concerns, questions, Jeff can relay them to the chair. Um, the chair can talk with Jeff and, and, and relay any of those messages to the applicant. But I think Jeff knows what to do here. Okay. Any any further comment? Yeah, I have one thing to say. In terms of yes. time, the landscaping industry and the choice of plants is shutting down rapidly. Plants are becoming increasingly scarce. It's now almost Thanksgiving coming up. This is a great time during the winter getting to prepare ourselves for doing a lot of work come March and in the springtime with the plans, locating the trees and doing all of that. So we haven't really done much, I think, to delay anything because in terms of the landscaping and the plants, not much takes place now anyways, all right, so. Was there, uh, if, if this project were to be approved, is there a time frame on when construction or anything would actually start? Uh, yeah, it's getting close to when you cannot pour the court. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It's getting close to the time where we cannot pour the court for the that company that does it for nighttime temperatures and contraction. It's post tensioned. So yeah. that's just what they tell me. Okay. And then just right. We've, we've changed a little bit meeting to meeting just on some of the requirements and that's, I can understand it's necessary and things come up, but just 
maybe some guidance and I, I'll go with Jeff on planting back along the easement line is great. I'd like to see everything, but on one side, it's can't go in there at all. There'll be the silt uh, lines and then trying not to even disturb that. So it'd be great to put trees east of the court, but I don't know who, who does, if that's you guys or legal for from the easement side of things. I know uh, you have the uh, easement document. So it would be, it'd be great to put more there if, if allowed and that. I, I think that that's, that's something else that we will uh, talk to legal about as far as, you know, we, we certainly, you know, when you read the easement, it, it's very clear during that easement about um, you know, no filling, no removing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, if we're talking about one foot or two foot of, uh, of potential disturbance for the sole reason of, plantings, etc. you know, that uh, we'll have to see about what types of, of exceptions that could be made. You know, I don't think we're talking about going in 10 and 12, 15 feet to the easement area and doing any removal destruction where we could potentially be talking about one or two feet or maybe three feet here. So I guess that, that that's something that Jeff Summers uh, and I will, will talk, uh, reread the easement that was put in place. It's, it's very clear, it's very specific about virtually it's it's untouchable um so what you know we have to go back and look at what is our jurisdiction on that if we have any uh with respect to an exception for plantings and plantings only for the benefit of the wildlife habitat and that would be the rationale so uh i will ask we'll have to you know we're, I, it looks like we're going to be continuing this hearing um i don't know uh, typically we continue it two weeks from now uh, Jeff, when is our next meeting? Is it the first week in November? Yes, it's uh, November 5th. November 5th. So I would ask the applicants if they would be prepared to present again on November 5th, uh, if that was a suitable time frame. And But again, we would like to have those plans in place. Uh, you know, we'd like to have them by close of business on the Tuesday before. We'd really like to have them before then. But if we're talking about, you know, simple minor adjustments here, then I think, you know, 48 hours um, giving you the, the, the utmost length of time here. Typically, we only give seven days. But how much time do you need? Let me cut to the chase. Oh, are you asking me how much time I need to adjust my plans? Well, adjust the plans in order not to conform with the plans of the landscaping to make them sure the landscaping plan is also um, matches the, the, the specifications of the engineering plans. I can have, I can have that ready within the next uh, five days. Okay. So if we continue this to November 5th, is that fine? Is that going to give you time? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can I, can I add something, Jay? I think Jeff can fairly quickly get a hold of legal counsel and find out what we can do in the easement or get a rough idea of what we can do in the easement so that doesn't have to be delayed. And I think Tom Bell recommended we go to his satellite photograph and you actually can count the trees. So we, I think by the end of next week, we can know what we can do in the easement area. And I think by Tom's uh, technology, a uh, satellite photograph, we can have a rough idea of the number of trees we're talking about. So we're, you know, we're being more specific as we go along and you know, preparing for the next meeting, Jay. Yep, I don't doubt that at all. Okay, so why don't we could just, we continue this hearing until November 5th. Are there any, any objections? Okay. Noted, we will continue this hearing until November 5th. See you all back here then. All right. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Our next item of business is uh, yeah. originally scheduled for 705. It's an NOI 20-23, 183 Atlantic Ave, a boardwalk for the Fernandos. This uh, project has been continued. We will continue that to our next hearing of November 5th. 
Next item of business is approval of minutes. So for May 14th and 8-8, the 8-8 uh, minutes will be put off until the next hearing, uh, until uh, next hearing of November 5th. I did have some brief comments to the May 14th minutes. Angela, um, I hopefully you have incorporated those. I saw that Mr. McFarlane had incorporated, uh, had some comments as well. Hopefully those comments have been incorporated into uh, into the, the new minutes. And so long, did anybody else have any comments to the May 14th minutes? Okay. Um, assuming that those comments have uh, have been incorporated, we'll, uh, I'll make a motion, Jay Pimpari, to approve the minutes of May 14th. 2020. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fallon. We'll do this by roll call vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Kathy Berrigan. I was not there at that meeting. Okay, so you just recuse yourself from the minutes. Okay, I'm sorry. I recuse myself from the minutes. Kathy. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Er uh, Eric Eisenhower. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Uh, Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Uh, I'm bad with the alphabet tonight. Chris McFarlane. Chris McFarlane, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. Marianne. Marianne Weatherall, aye. That vote passes 5-0 to 1. Okay. Uh, next item of business was the reorg. I'm going to skip to that for a minute. Uh, conservation agent update. Jeff, anything you want to update us on? What's going on around town, sites, etc.? Um... Well, I was just going to mention the Spring Street thing, but we talked about that earlier. Um, is something going on there, Jeff? Y yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so it's kind of a it's kind of a long a long backstory to it. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if you want to hear it now, or, or I can just call you afterwards and let you know. The reason I bring it up is that a neighbor up down there called me and said, holy, holy hell is breaking out on Spring Street now. You got to come down and look at it. So it was um, no, I don't think there's any holy hell going on there. But um, the um, <laughs> the applicant who uh, uh, so you may recall it was 2016. The applicant was denied the, uh, an order of conditions and a stormwater permit. Um, the town. Uh, he did receive a superseding order of conditions from the state, but he did um, did not um, receive a um, stormwater permit. So the, in the last few years, um, going through the courts, the court finally decided that yes, um, the town's um, decision on the stormwater permit is upheld. Uh, so he does need to get a stormwater permit for the house. Um, so then there's so then there's two issues. So you have the state which issued a superseding order under the wetlands, um, Protection Act, the, the town didn't um, uh, ar argue that, so that, that went by. And then he does still needs a stormwater permit to build a house. Yeah. So a couple, maybe a month ago, he came to me and said he wanted to start doing some preliminary work, removing some trees, et cetera. And so I said, well, you know, you still need to get your stormwater permit before you can build this house. He said, I know, I know. Um, so anyhow, so I called um, our legal counsel and I said, you know, what's the deal here with this? The state issued a, a wetlands permit while, you know, he still needs a, a stormwater permit to build a house. So um, what, what she said to me was, you know, if he has any questions regarding um, the wetlands aspect of this permit, uh, he should call DEP. Um, you know, to you know, make sure that whatever work he does isn't outside of the scope of the project. Well, at the same time, she said, you know, he could do what he wanted to do there so long as it didn't require um, a stormer permit be filed. So that's where that's where it stands. So he wants to do preliminary work under the wetlands. Um, the uh, superseding bylaw, uh, superseding order conditions issued by the state. Well, at the same time, in order to actually build a house, he still needs to come before the commission to get a stormwater permit. Um, so I did go out there the other day just to see what had happened in the meantime. Um, and I, I really didn't notice any changes. I, and Jay, you said you had gone out there too. I don't know what, 
if you notice anything being moved or happened. No, so I haven't. Um, and just uh, for everyone's uh, just point of um, clarification, the only reason that they were issued a an, an order of conditions or the state upheld the, the 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 notice of intent is because in the town's denial order of conditions was one day late it was submitted on the 22nd day as opposed to the 21st day so uh, due to a technicality only that um that they were uh, allowed to they were issued the order of conditions we argued that over and over won't get into that um but it was mainly just a, a total technicality an unfortunate situation that happened years ago um so but the court did uphold our argument on the stormwater so um, I, I went out there earlier in the week. There is a silt sock that basically lines the outside of the uh, driveway. I would just ask, and I've asked Jeff to, to keep an eye on this project as well. Um, if anybody sees anything, you know, there most likely will be construction going on there in the form of utilities going down the line. But if you see anything above and beyond that, um, you know, feel free to call Jeff or, or inquire about it. But um, you know, there they inevitably will most likely be some some utility drainage going in at least the driveway. Okay. Yeah, one of the one of the first things he wanted to do was um, actually run utilities from the street to connect to the to the existing cottage that's there now. Um, you know, my first question to him was, why would you want to bother doing this when you don't have your stormwater permit in place? But anyhow. Um, Installing utilities in an existing driveway is an exempt activity anyhow, so he doesn't even need a permit for that. Yeah. Um, the only requirement is that the uh, that the trench be backfilled at the each at the end of each workday. Um, so that's why he put the uh, silt sock along the edges of the driveway in anticipation of doing that. Okay, uh, beyond Spring Street, Jeff, anything to to mention? Um, no, not no. Okay. Um, as far as a chair update to go, I, I, I want to jump back here. And I, as I was talking, I wanted to uh, share my screen and show you the memo that I had actually pulled up. This was from attorney Henderson, who was arguing the, the Hellenic church down the end of Jerusalem road or the beginning. If you start from Hull, when he was, quite, he, he, I, I had asked Mr. Henderson way back. Well, I guess, not too far ago, January 2018, for his interpretation of a structure and because I questioned whether or not a foundation that had been in existence for, I don't know, 10 plus years or almost 20 years now was still a structure in his determination, as you can see here, and he goes through it. And the state code, we have Cohasset codes and we have state building codes. And according to uh, his memo here, structures, etc. I'll zoom in on fences that are over six feet high is considered a structure. The structure um, that at the property that we were talking about earlier on was at 10 feet. So before, while it's fresh in my mind here, uh, I want to bring it up and Jeff, I'll forward you this, uh, this memo from Mr. Henderson. If you don't have it already. Yeah, I was just going to go look in the file to see if I had it, but yeah. if you'll do that, that'd be great. Okay, I'll take care of that. Um, there's always so much going on. Jeff and I had a lengthy, lengthy discussion a couple of days ago about a bunch of things. Uh, I think that as I alluded to earlier in the evening, just trying to, we have no control over this getting in and out of the Zoom thing, cutting and pasting. We'll continue to work on that. But um, you know, thanks to Jeff too for. Uh, for making the change and, and Angela, if you had any part to do with that as well, thank you of just beefing up the, at least the town webpage so that all the applications now are all there and people can view them well in advance um, so that they can see them. So uh, hopefully that goes a long way. Justin, um, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt. Is it possible for, um, Angela to talk with uh, Dan and IT to take a look at the OneDrive. When I'm looking at site plans, and this has happened um, consistently, it, they'll go away. So I'm in the OneDrive and I'm looking at a site plan and I'm hovering over it for a little bit and then it 
goes away. And I don't know if that's happened to other people. I feel like I've discussed it with them, Jim, what have you. I, I, it, just, it just still keeps happening. I did finally get access to OneDrive. So thank you, Angela, oh. for doing that for me. Yeah. <laughs> that was a big deal. Um, but um, that's still an issue for me. This cycle. Okay. So um, one thing that I do might help out, first of all, at using Google Chrome as your browser is the you only way to go. Yep. You have to use Google Chrome. Yep. And then yep. secondly, what I do the minute the site plan comes up, I just download it. It's like I'm sharing my screen with you. I'm sharing my screen. I'm sharing actual a PDF file. I'm, yep. not, I'm not sharing it from the actual OneDrive because it takes too long. So okay. I, I, I download, and what I've also asked Jeff to do, and, and, and Jeff's done that, so thanks again, son yelling in the background here, is um, is to put the most up-to-date information on there, like a case in point, like 76 Lambert's Lane, we've got about 43 different landscaping plans. So to just label those, like if the plan came in on October 20th, label it October 20th. And so I am not looking at a plan from October 7th or September or August. It's very confusing with all these updates of plans. So Jeff's now uh, created like revisions and revisions dated. So sub files of actual files. So we can just go in there and there's one or two. Um, but also, you know, you've, so, so yeah, but I download them and save them to my computer so that while all these meetings are going on, if you're not organizing, sharing your screen, you can just pop up the PDF file and then boom, there it is. Yeah, so, I can't I can't do that on the computer I'm using now, but I can get one to do it on. Okay. Yeah. All yes, right. Angela just wrote in the question and answer thing that you reached out to Dan and he'll get in touch with you. Okay. <clears throat> um, you know, another thing that I've, uh, I've, I've harpered on with, with the town the IT folks is to get these Zoom sessions loaded up a lot faster than they are now. It wasn't even loaded up. Uh, and I, the link from the YouTube link wasn't loaded up until I believe late Monday night or Tuesday. So for the past 48 hours, I've been painfully listening to your four hour meeting from last week. You did a great job, guys, of hanging in there. So, um, Appreciate that, but hopefully the Zoom link. Go, yeah, and if we, you know, I've looked at other boards, and and they have go-to webinar. So if this Zoom thing is not working with everybody, or we continue to have problems, go-to webinar is another platform that I I use on a on a daily basis um, that I've had great results with. It's like so, Zoom, Jay. It's very similar to Zoom, but it's got much 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 better capabilities. Yeah. Um, with, with promoting people from attendees. I mean, this is kind of like, Zoom is like pretty basic. I, I would go to, go to I use it for work, so. So do I. It's more um, comprehensive. Mm -hmm. and this is like, yeah, this is like the junior league version. Yeah. Well, I would expect nothing else from town government. This is the junior high school version. It's great for me. Um, and I also yeah. had to meet with Dan myself to correct some things. Like I had to go yeah. and sit down. Yeah. All right. Um, that's really all I had for the agent, which brings me up to the most important uh, part of the evening, the reorganization. Uh, typically we do this, well, we are required to do this as all boards are once uh, per year. We've been waiting to do this uh, when we've had a full board and we now have a full board, we have our associates on board. We couldn't have done this in June, July, August, or even early September because everything was still in flux, but we now have a full board. We've got seven voting members and we have two associate members. I've been uh, the chair of this commission for about three years now. Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful job. The pay sucks. But, you know, it, <laughs> the hours aren't that good. <laughs> great trouble. But, you know? great but trouble. It's, it's a great resume builder, let me tell you. Um, but I think that my term ends for the, on this commission in June or July of 2021. Uh, it's been an honor to serve as chair. Uh, however, due to many reasons, as, as you can see now, I, I'm in a hospital. I'm at Children's Hospital in a freaking hospital room with my son screaming here and doctors coming in and out trying to run this Zoom platform. And his, uh, his medical conditions have uh, taken a, a, a turn where I'm uh, due to in, in that. 
So taking care of him has become a, a full-time job. Um, but, and I'd intended on, on probably not doing this too much longer anyway. I'm happy to help out the next person. I've said on many public platforms to the board of selectmen over and over, and, and, and you heard me when we had our uh, meetings with uh, town council in the city, excuse me, the town manager, that this is the most knowledgeable and, uh, and, and educated board or commission uh, currently now that I've sat on in my seven years here. When I first started, we had uh, a, a cast of characters, some good, some not so good, that basically just showed up on Thursday nights and hadn't done the homework, hadn't done the site visits, and basically ruled in favor of however the majority was going and didn't really care. Uh, you've all been very dedicated. Uh, I see that. It's not going unnoticed. It's not going unnoticed <laughs> around town. So I'm extremely proud to have, to have served as your chair. So having said that, I am uh, going to very proudly step down, and at this point, I would uh, I would ask if there are any nominations to serve as chair between now and our next assignment, which would be sometime June or July of 2021. It's a great paying job. Uh, do I hear any nominations for chair? I'll nominate Eric Eisenhower for chair. I will second that nomination. Um, before we, we take a vote, are there any other nominations for chair? I am going to need Chris McFarland for chair. <laughs> Am I allowed <laughs> to speak on my own behalf? Yeah, you, you, for, for, the, for, the, for the sake of moving the motion forward, we would have two motions for, I'll second the motion for the sake of, for the sake of that, but you are allowed to speak. I, I, I would great, graciously, uh, Decline because I am far too busy these days to try to do an adequate job for the Conservation Commission. But I thank you for the nomination. Does that does that mean if voted in you would uh, you would respectfully uh, step down on day one? Uh, yes, I think I think I would have to resign completely on day one. Okay. <laughs> does that mean you right. would not accept a vice president role? <laughs> I might be able to handle that. Okay. Uh, so we, we have uh, we have one nomination on the table. Do we have any other nominations before we move that to a vote? Okay. We have a nomination for Eric Eisenhower in a second. So we will do this by a roll call vote. I will also make note that, yes, we will be uh, nominating a vice president and we will be nominating uh, taking sure. nominations for Treasury, and then we do have liaisons to other committees as well. Um, Jeff, if or, or Angela, if you can remind me again because I didn't, um, I forgot to write those down. We have a liaison to the Harbor Committee, a liaison to the CPC, uh, and a lais liaison to uh, Open Space. And if I forget one, remind me. But anyway, we'll do this by roll call vote. So uh, all those in favor of uh, Eric Eisenhower chairing this beautiful uh, Conservation Commission until our next reorg, which would probably be June of 2021, please say aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Uh, Eric Eisenhower. I abstain. Can't vote for myself. Uh, Trisha Grady. <laughs> Trisha Grady, aye. Chris McFarlane. Chris McFarlane, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. Mary Ann. I for uh, Eric. Great. <laughs> All right. For a vice, I would like to nominate Chris McFarlane for vice chairman. Can we hear a second? Second. Second by Eric Eisenhower. Are there any other nominations? Okay. All those in favor of Chris McFarlane serving as vice chair, which means if Eric gets hit by a bus or unfortunately cannot attend a meeting, Chris would chair the meeting. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Eric, aye. Chris, uh, excuse me, Trish Grady. Trish Grady, aye. Chris McFarlane. Stain. Jay Pimpari, aye. Mary Ann. Aye. That vote passes 5-0 to 1. We are now in search of a secretary slash treasurer. I nominate Mary Ann Weatherall to serve as secretary slash treasurer. Second. I'm terrible at math. So I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We have no money anyway. Again, the, the, the yeah, he, this, the pay's not very good. 
uh, all those that inherit the other nominations. So the treasurer's secretary, basically the responsibility, the responsibility of the secretary treasurer are just to um, keep on top of the, the notes, excuse me, the minutes to make sure that the minutes are, are, are up to date. And we've been, uh, Angela's been doing a great job actually with, with the minutes. I, I believe the, uh, the latest minutes of, I don't even know what it was, whatever was on the agenda, uh, are the only minutes outstanding outside of tonight, the, the August 8th minutes. Uh, and, and so we've been doing great with that. And so thanks, Angela, for, for keeping up with, with that. So doing the minutes and making sure that they are accurate. You don't have to do the minutes. Angela does the minutes. You just if the chairperson says, hey, we're eight months behind on the minutes, the mm -hmm. secretary sends an email to Angela and says, where are the minutes? Oh, I'm good at that. <laughs> it's 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 a it's a, it's there is like less than zero responsibility. It's 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 great resume builder. Yeah, it's it's not a it's not a heavy lift at all. There's yeah. it's just to, to make sure it's just to make sure that someone else gets the minutes out. I nominate Marianne. Uh, well, we had a nomination in a second. So roll call vote, Kathy Berrigan for um, nominate. Uh, uh, please say aye whether or not you vote to uh, to have Marianne as secretary slash treasurer. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Aye. Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Chris McFarlane. McFarlane, aye. Jay Pimpare, aye. Marianne. <laughs> right. All right. So, you might as well. That vote passes at six to zero. In space sometimes. Yeah. I'll tell you what's happening there. So we also have liaisons to other committees, and um, I don't know if anybody wants to speak on behalf of that. I, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Marianne. You are the liaison to open space. Yes, and there it okay. is active. It is active. So it's, it's okay. Fun. It's a good board. They're a really determined group, I have to say. So, okay. Uh, how how do you how do you feel about carrying on with that? Uh, yeah, I'll continue. Yes. All right. I nominate Marianne Weatherall to um, to uh, be the liaison to the Open Space Committee. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you, Trish Grady. Uh, all those in favor will just uh, roll call vote. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric. Aye. Chris. Aye. Trisha. Aye. Bless you all. Um, <laughs> Jay Pimpari, aye, Marianne. Oh, yes. Great. Okay. Um, and again, you know, it, it's liaison if it, I don't know how often they, they meet. If you can make the meeting, then great. If you can't make the meeting, you know, you're not required to actually make any, attend any of these meetings, et cetera. It's really just to uh, to keep an eye out. If, if there are any uh, conservation issues, you know, reach out to the chair of these particular committees and say, hey, if there's a conservation issue, please bring us in. Um, if not, then, then so be it. Uh, another committee is the, uh, Eric, was it CPC you were on? And yeah. um, I mean, how often does that meet? I mean, and, and again, a lot of most of those projects aren't even two or three months. And, you know, uh, they handle mostly, as you know, the CPC gets, a, I think, one and a half percent of the tax from all land sales and gets stipend from the state government. So they, they have a working budget about five or six hundred thousand dollars a year. And they're committed to supporting recreation, open spaces that, um, that uh, Marianne's working on. And schools, they do a lot of um, uh, affordable housing, all right? Mm -hmm. And we meet, they meet now about four or five times a year mm -hmm. under Russ Benetti, okay? Mm -hmm. and, um, it's mandatory. There has to be a member from conservation on the commission. That's not something that's voluntary, so. Great. Um, are there any nominations for to serve on that committee? I, I, I go ahead. I, if no one else wants to do it. I'm willing to continue, Jay. It's not not a big time. Yeah, not a big time taker. And I've already gone through the learning curve and no Russ and and all that. But if someone else would like to do it, I certainly would stand down. Do we have any other uh, interested parties? 
Okay. Well, then I'll nominate Eric Eisenhower to stay <laughs> as the liaison to the CPC. Okay. I will second that. Uh, okay. Uh, you know what? With, uh, just for sake of uh, consistency here, we'll do this by roll call vote. Chris, uh, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Uh, Eric. Eric Eisner, aye. Trisha Grady. Trisha Grady, aye. Chris. Chris McFarlane, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. Mary Ann. Aye. All right. And then last, I, I believe we have a liaison to the Harbor Committee. And uh, Chris has been that liaison. Again, there is, you know, when you think of the harbor, don't automatically go, oh, my God, what does that even mean? Because, yes, there, there's a lot going on with the harbor. Um, it's inevitable that this committee would probably be receiving something from the harbor. Um, it's, it's, it, it's in front of the planning board. It should become as no surprise that at some point I would imagine that CONCOM is going to be receiving some form of an application. Chris, is there any um, anything you want to tell us about that committee? Or uh, I don't think we've it's been a heavy lift at all. No, they were they were very active until they put out their uh, harbor plan, and then things kind of slowed down, and even more so when uh, the pandemic hit. So it's been pretty it's been pretty slow. Okay. Um, Chris, you and I should probably talk about that because the Open Space Committee really wants to know what's happening over there. And I don't have anything to report, and they're disappointed that we have no information in okay. this area. But if I can share something what you know, it might be helpful to the Open Space Committee. All right. Um, so I, I, I'm happy to stay, but I, I see Trish is just chomping at the bit to be part of to be a liaison. So. I was trying to get rid of my video. I was like, oh. <laughs> run and hide. <laughs> are, you, are you saying she's looking to be nominated? I, I think so. You can, you know, as Chris did, you can always deny the nomination and say you have uh, other things on your plate. Um, uh, Chris, is it something you want to continue on? I mean, you know, I, uh, I, I'm happy to help out if needed and take one for the team here for the next nine months. If, but unless you want to continue on, it doesn't seem like it's a big heavy lift. No, it hasn't been. Right. I, I think you have a heavier lift with what you're doing. So, and if Trish is not going to jump right up and do it, I guess I'll stay. <laughs> oh, I feel All so right. guilty. You know That's my buttons. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. I nominate uh, Chris McFarlane as the liaison to the Harbor Committee. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Absolutely. Trisha Grady. <laughs> Thank God. Aye. <laughs> uh, Chris McFarlane. Aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. Marianne. Aye. Have we left off any other liaisons? Is James on anything? No notes from Angela, so. Yeah, no. I don't think... I don't think there was anything else. What was um? What was Alex the liaison to? Alex. Yeah. Uh, he yeah, he was CPC. He was CPC. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you know, again, first of all, thank you, Eric, Chris, Marianne, for uh, for stepping up and, and taking one for the team. Um, you know, it, it, it's not so much of a, of a heavy lift as, as Eric had mentioned, you know, it, it's it's great to be aware of what's coming down the line. And if we can uh, have some input and some value into some of these projects, then great, especially, again, with open space. And, you know, you learn a little bit more about what's going on around town above and beyond um, the commission and can and, and can add that in there. Um, so. Uh, I don't have any other Caduce. Uh, there's a question here. Question just came in. Whoa. Did that just come in? Oh no, open. No, oh, she's Angela. Something said, else. Okay, great. Thank you. So this, All um, right. We look at these again in June. Is that right, Justin? Yeah, it'll okay. probably be some type of uh, late July, maybe early August. What we have okay. to do is wait for. So come um, again sometime, uh, probably June, July, uh, okay. hopefully given that there's no pandemic, I, uh, I, I'm i termed out. So I, I'm, I'm off the commission then, which would be that there would be a full-time opening. Um, yep. Historically, what the board of sele the select board who makes the decision would, uh, if we both, if we had two associates and they chose to continue to be, uh, want to become um, full-time members, 
they would, in, in addition to any other members of the public, would be have the opportunity to uh, be interviewed by the select board, and the select board makes that decision. Um, so there's one full-time opening, and and then you would do another reorg. Um, yeah. And again, you know, typically chairs only serve a, a year. Yeah, the select board is like it's like it's mandatory someone jumps off. So it's all you always have a different chair of the select board. Um, no one has jumped jumped up to this position in the past few years. Uh, yeah, it's like you have to resign for someone to step up here. But Eric, you're going to do a great job. Uh, we'll see. You know, and, and Eric and I, Eric and I have talked a little bit about uh, running the meeting and positions and when to take them, when not to take them. I have the utmost, yeah, I know, buddy. Uh, I have the utmost faith in you, Eric, and, and I'll, I'll be right here to answer questions as well. Um, I, uh, and anything. I just finished a, a course on how to how to run a, a peaceful and calm commission, all right? So, <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I'm taking the personal skills now. Yeah. Take a little Valium and have a couple glasses of wine before the next meeting. But look, so, let me tell you one thing. If someone's interested in town affairs uh, and would like to go on the CPC, that's not a problem. I mean, they get involved in all the affordable housing, the library, historical society. Um, they involved in open spaces because they come before and they review big projects. So uh, you're, you're really in the thick and the thin if you'd like to, if someone wants to be civically active, I'd step aside for them if they wanted to do it. Okay. Okay. I, and I'll, I'll brush up on stuff so I'm prepared in, in the summer, you guys. I promise. Okay. <laughs> well, space isn't that difficult. Well, we I, I have listened. I did listen to the tape. Uh, I listened to the tape of, of last meeting, and it, it's good to see more voices here. Again, historically, going back, it was two, maybe three members, and sometimes a fourth, uh, voicing some concerns. Uh, I'm glad to see that, that all our... Uh, I'm not leaving any of the associates out. You feel free to chime in, Tom. Thanks for your assistance. You, you know, Heather, uh, feel free to, to chime in should you choose to. Uh, I know there's there's a little bit of a learning curve, et cetera, but you know, feel free. Um, I, I I I didn't specifically, uh, you know, I, I, as chair, I never really wanted to put anybody on the spot and say, hey, what do you think? Sometimes, you know, if I if I sense that you have a little bit of an opinion. I'll do that, but if someone's really silent, I, I think there's there's a reason why they're silent. As I I don't I don't feel comfortable putting them on the spot, uh, um, but maybe maybe Eric will. <laughs> in any event, no. <laughs> uh, are there any other uh, reasonably uh, anything uh, topics anticipated within forty eight hours? No, I just want to remind everybody that the Mac classes are going on all this week, and it's been really fun learning. Yeah. 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 I, I know, um, Eric. It, it, what, have there been any issues with signing up with them? Did you just email Lindsay and she signs you right up, right? Uh, you, yeah, you call really Lindsay, easy. you tell her what you want to do. You get an email. It's got all the Zoom data on it. Uh, she takes care of it. It's really fast and efficient. And they have one on Saturday morning on Piers and, and Marsh Boardwalks. Mira, our subject yeah. of uh, I mean, that's an hour on Saturday morning, which ought to be interesting. Yeah. yeah. They've all been very helpful. I mean, yeah. they, some yeah. of it's been overwhelming information. Last night was overwhelming. Yeah, that was yeah. overwhelming. And she was so yeah. fast and then jumping back and forth. And some of the printouts, I don't I don't like how they organize their printouts. And but okay. it's been all valuable. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Very yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah, again, uh, you, you know, you hopefully you all get those emails from Mac. Uh, I think it's uh, Joe or Joel sends them. I encourage you. Uh, this is their fall conference. So if there's anything of importance there you feel, just jump on it and, and register. And the town of Cohasset has been paying for that. I was surprised how smoothly it went, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. Be Good. Smooth. You know, sort of um, pickup free, free. Right. I mean, I think there was 55 or 60 people on one last night. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, People. Great. Uh, Jeff Summers, what does the next meeting look like as far as we continued? So we've got two continuances. We have 76 Lambert and 183 Atlantic, which were uh, continued. Do we have any other new applications that have come in? Um, yeah, it's just for a new home up on uh, Dolan Lane. Okay. 
that, that's um, it. And then there's a, a, a an admin stormwater permit, which I put on OneDrive too. But that doesn't require a hearing. Okay. And what is the time frame on that? Um, 21 days. So, um, if it, yeah, if anybody wants to look at that admin stormwater permit, it's actually 435 Jerusalem Road Drive. They want to put a pool in. Um, you can just look at that. If you have any comments that you want to give me, you can just you can email me. Okay. Property than we looked at today, like for you said. Yeah, it was the same one that that uh, that had the RDA, the wetlands issue. Oh. They're gonna put a pool in the wetland. No, they're gonna put the they're gonna put the pool in their uh, in their lawn. <laughs> in, the, in the hole. Property adjacent to them. Can I ask that? No, that just that actually just sold. That's like I think it's uh, fourteen Haystack Lane. Uh, it's funny. My my son's GI doctor's brother um, said oh, I just he just bought a house fourteen Haystack Lane, and I, I saw him on Saturday morning when I was over there. Um, so it's just land. Small. That's land. No, for the the property next to Thirty Five Jerusalem Road that, that was on uh, the agenda tonight. Yeah. If you come to the fork in the road, instead of going left up Jerusalem Road, you go right to that little cul-de-sac. Yeah. Uh, right at the end of that, uh, which is no longer an IBW, there's a driveway and it goes up around in the back. There's a brand new house in the back there. Yeah. We had already approved that. Right. The owner's okay. name is Matt. He's from New York City. Yes, correct. Yeah, you must have bumped into him as well. I did. Yeah. All right. Um, again, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to go uh, get a completely unrestless uh, night of sleep here at the Chateau de Children's Hospital. Um, yeah, I hope it so, goes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll see you all in uh, in two weeks, November 5th. Hopefully I will. Do we need here. to move to close the hearing? Oh, yeah. yeah, motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, by roll call vote to keep it consistent, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower. Aye. Uh, Trish Grady. Trish Grady, aye. Chris McFarlane. Chris McFarlane, aye. Jay Pimpari, aye. Marianne. Marianne Weatherald, aye. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks for Thank hanging in so there. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone vote. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Night, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Good night.